Good morning, Venture. Don't you love this season? Yes. Don't, don't you? I mean, I love, I love all the decorations and the Christmas time and starting to sing the carols and, and the celebration. So appreciative to so many of you who showed up here to help us decorate around the campus and we're getting ready for this season. And so uh, we love that. And, and in light of Christmas, man, there is no better book that says Christmas in my mind than the book of Romans. No, actually, I, I promise you we're going to finish Romans. We're doing something a little bit different this year. We are, we're going to finish out in Romans, and then we'll celebrate the Christmas story with all that we have coming at the end of the year. But uh, this morning, as we dive in, and especially as we think about this season in December, I, I want to ask those of you who are part of the Venture family, those of who, you who this is your church, this is your home, uh, if you're visiting with us, maybe you're new, you're still kicking the tires with it. This doesn't apply to you as much, but for those of us that we say this is Venture Church family, I want you to really partner with us in this season. And I really want you to consider it in three ways. One, this coming week with Winter Wonderland. Um, it, it's gonna be huge. We'll have thousands of people on our campus. We wanna try to have it on the back field. It may be too wet. We may have to move it up to the front. We're doing it though because it gives us an opportunity to reach people who would never come to a church campus otherwise. When we did fall festival, almost half the people that had come had never been a part of Venture in any way. And so that's why we do that. It's a great invitation to our community. We have people that come and, and so many of them would say, man, I can't believe you guys would do this for us as a community. No strings attached. That's the goal out of it. And so if you could come out and serve with us, if you've got an opportunity to serve for a couple hours, and when we say serving, it's probably, it's, you know, manning the hot chocolate and make sure, you know, nobody's spiking it for one, but, uh, you know, other <laughs> things with that. It's, it's not hard stuff, but we need manpower in it. And so if you could come out and be a part of it, but here's what I'd ask everybody to do. Who on your street, who in your office, who do you know that you could go, man, they would love to attend that. They are a family or they've got little kids or, or just, it's a great fun, just kind of Christmas night. Even if you don't have kids, it's the lights are here and all that's going on with it. And it would give you an opportunity to hang out with them for a couple hours and maybe develop relationship more. First thing is, is partner in that. Second thing, start praying about the Christmas Eve services. We do our Christmas Eve services in light of the fact that we have a gospel message to share with the world. And this is one of the times of year where people are actually interested in coming to a church service and being a part of it. And so we always look at it, man, what a great opportunity to share, not only that Jesus came into the world, but why he came into the world. And so if there's somebody that is in your oikos, in your circle that you've been praying for, you've been thinking about, you could invite, invite them to that service. You'd be surprised the people that wanna attend a Christmas Eve service that might not wanna attend any other time. The final thing I'd ask for those who are partners in the church, I really would ask that you pray and you think about your year in giving. You know, as a church, we're impacted like everyone else in the economy with that. And we've been watching it for this half of year. And we're running probably about five to 8% behind normal budget in giving. And uh, we monitor that. Trust me, we've got teams that we want to make sure we never spend what we don't have. And we had resources that were here, but we're a church that we don't sit on those resources. We don't think that is what God's called us to do. So we've, we've already invested them. We invested them in the next generation. We're renovating a building because we believe God says, man, I gave you that to use it for the kingdom, not as your security. He's our security. And so in that, I just ask you, if you're a part of the Venture family, and, and you see what God's doing to your family, in your family, in your life, in our community, to be able to do Winter Wonderland and, and Christmas Eve and these services and all that we do, 
I would just ask that you make part of your giving, pray about that, that you would give to your church, that you'd support the ministry here, that you'd believe in what God's doing in this place. And so as you're you're thinking about, especially year in, it's a a time when a lot of us, we're thinking about where we're gonna give. And sometimes you can look at something, you go, oh man, I, I just give to need. I would hope you give to vision. I would hope you give because you go, you know, I wanna be a part of how God's shaping the Bay Area and what he's doing through my church family in that. Hey, before we dive in the passage, will you just pray with me? Father, I do thank you. I thank you that you have filled this church with partners. You've called us as pastors, as leaders, to equip them to do the work of the ministry. And I I thank you when I look around this campus, I look across this room, I look at each of the different ministries, you have given us partners who love to step forward. Lord, I pray in this season, would we be missional partners? Would we look at our neighborhoods? Would we look at our friends? Would we look at our communities and give them the opportunity to be introduced to Jesus Christ? Lord, I pray we'd be sacrificial partners for each of us. You tell us in your word to give that generosity changes our hearts. And you tell us directly to give to you. And so Lord, I I pray in this season, I know so many people are impacted economically. We feel it across this body. We feel it across the Bay Area. But Lord, I also know that you're the source of our security. And so we give because you first gave to us. We give because you're dad and you look out for us. So I pray even in this season, would you teach us when it would be really easy for all of us to pull back in fear, to trust you and to be a source of generosity for this world. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you today as we dive into a part of your word and we talk about issues that frankly divide churches. Issues that uh, can get people sideways really quick. And so I ask for your grace over me (laughs) as I talk about them, knowing that we trust in your word and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, hopefully my prayer maybe piqued your attention a little bit (laughs) that you're going, wait a second, Tim, what are these issues that you're talking about? And, And we're hitting at the end of Romans, a really important section of scripture. And it's really important because it speaks to one of the things that makes church so unique. It's one of the things that's different than the rest of the world. I I love how Philip Yancey put it. He, He said, beginning with Pentecost, the Christian church dismantled the barriers of whether you were a man or a woman, whether your race was, your social class, that had marked all the congregations. You got a guy like Paul, who as a rabbi had prayed, because the rabbis would pray this prayer every day. They would give thanks that he was not born a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. And then he would write these words, no, in the church there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Jesus. One modern Indian pastor told Yancey, most of what happens in Christian churches including even some of your miracles, can be duplicated in Hindu and Muslim Muslim congregations. But in my area, only Christians strive, however ineptly, to mix men and women of different caste, races, and social groups. That's actually the real miracle. This diversity that across every section of life, that in any given church, you have this place where infants and grandparents and unemployed and executives and immigrants and blue bloods, and and no matter who you are, they're mixed together and they're united together. And it's becoming more and more rare in the world that you have any group like this that would be mixed across the different lines. It's the miracle of what only Christ can do in uniting us in the Holy Spirit. And and what we see in that is in the church, unity is more important than uniformity. We're called to be unified, not uniform. And here's what I mean with that. When you look across the church, not everybody's gonna be like you. They don't think like you. They don't look like you. They don't come from the same walk of life. And especially for those of us who get the privilege of living in the Bay Area, this is all the more true. It's one of my favorite things about venture. 
is that we, we, we have people from all over the world in different places and we bring different cultures and languages and perspectives out of that. In the church, we're called to be unified, but we're not gonna be uniform. It'll never be that way. It can't be because he's called people from all over the world. In fact, if you find yourself in a context where everyone's exactly like you and you all think the way, same way and you do the same thing, you're probably not in a church, you're probably in a cult. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Where, where it's suddenly we're gonna now define life down to every single part of it. And Paul's writing a church in Rome and part of the congregation have come from a Jewish background and they've gone to synagogue their whole life and they've practiced all of the Jewish law their whole life. And then you've got Gentiles from different parts of the world that have practiced all things and they've come together and they're having some tensions of how do we do this? And so Paul has to explain for them, okay, here's how you gotta be in unity without demanding uniformity. Now, when I say this and when I teach on this, we're gonna get down to the issues that he talks about. Some people go to the other extreme that they go, oh, there's no issues we ever divide over. We're just all supposed to get along about everything and you never disagree with anyone. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. In fact, it, it's important. Augustine has uh, been quoted. I don't know if he actually said it or not. He said, in essentials, we have unity in non-essentials, liberty in all things, charity. In other words, there's kind of three levels that you think about it and, and you can see it in your notes. It's important to understand the levels of the issues involved. There's some matters that are essential to the gospel. There's some matters. So who is Jesus? He's actually God. He's the son of God. He's always existed. He's the God man. What did Jesus do? He died on the cross and he rose again. Paul says, if you don't believe that, if that didn't happen, our whole faith is in vain. We have nothing to hold on to. That's an essential. He's the exclusive way of salvation. There's no other way to the Father but by Jesus. See, all, all of these would be, be issues around, and you might just write even salvation. The essential things that you would have to believe and you would have to know in order to have a relationship with God. And those are unequivocal. Those are the issues. Paul said, if an angel comes down and preaches a different gospel than this. You look at him, you say anathema. We have to divide over that because souls are at stake. Then there's a second level of issues. These are matters important to our faith, matters important to our faith. And so when, when you go through the Bible, what does the Bible say about our worship? What does the Bible say about how we treat one another? What does the Bible say about our sex lives? What does the Bible say about our money? What is the Bible, all throughout the Bible, what do we believe about the Bible? That it is the inspired word of God. These would be issues that sometimes I'll get asked as a pastor, well, if, if somebody's sleeping with another person, they're having sex outside of marriage, are they not a Christian? And I go, well, no, that, that doesn't overrule their Christianity because that's a first issue. They can be a Christian, but it's a sin issue in their life. And so we need to call it for what it is. In fact, the, the difference would be these issues, if you disagree with it, you, you're really disagreeing with salvation at stake. These issues are what scripture points out and says, yeah, these are sin issues. We need to direct them. We're gonna not only disagree, we're gonna speak into them. Now, these issues are important and they're all throughout the Bible. This next section is not dealing with these issues. Let me make sure I'm really clear on that because some people, when we start talking about the freedom that we have, they go, well, Tim, you wouldn't address. I go, yeah, because they fall under these. There's a third level, and these are matters of preference or opinion. These are things that it's my preference. It's my, I'm bringing maybe my cultural preference. I'm bringing my opinion to it. These are the issues that Paul's addressing in the church. Read with me if you've got your Bibles. If you don't, pull one of the blue ones in front of you. Page 1,127. We're gonna read from Romans 14, the first verses there as Paul's addressing the church. He says, I'll let you turn there. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. So he's used that word here. So he's, he's making it real clear. We're talking about this level of issues. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of one another? 
It is before his own master that he stands or falls. He will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats it in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? For we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God, as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So as you look at this, Paul's talking about in this case, two issues, kind of two issues that were dividing the church. One was the issue around meat. And uh, in Rome, if you were gonna buy meat from a butcher, almost all the meat that you would purchase had previously been sacrificed to an idol. And so it was, it was presented to an idol, it was presented to a God, and then it would make its way into the market. And, and so for some, especially for some Jewish believers who, I mean, idolatry is like rule number one of the 10 commandments. And they go, the only way to live that out is I can't eat meat that was ever presented to an idol. And so I, I can't eat meat, I'm gonna just eat vegetables as a result of that. And then you had others in the church, Paul included. Paul identifies, he, he's a meat eater. He's on team meat eater. And he goes, oh, oh, I don't have a problem with eating meat. I'm not worshiping anything. And, and especially a lot of people in the church, say, I can eat the meat. I mean, when I'm, you know, having a good steak, I'm not thinking about the idol. And yet the church is having a lot of tension over this. Some of it was over days. You had some people who thought, man, the Sabbath has always been on Saturday. Church should be on Saturday. Others said, no, no, it's the first day of the week. We recognize when Jesus rose from the dead. And it wasn't just the, the Sabbath, it was the holidays as well. Because especially for Jewish believers, their whole life, I mean, they've been going to the feast. They've been recognizing Passover and these important days. And they were so formative to their faith, they couldn't fathom, wait, we're in the church. We're not even gonna do anything for this. We're not even gonna recognize it. And you, you had this church and people were going, that's just wrong. What you're doing is wrong. And there was division over it. Now, probably no one here today, meat is probably not your key issue. When you go get meat at the store, I doubt you ask the butcher, hey, was this ever presented to an idol? <laughs> Those aren't our issues of the day, but we still struggle with the same. I listed some of the issues. Now I grew up in the South, especially, and was really exposed to fundamental churches. You'd be amazed the issues they can come up with. Everything I'll go through here, these are real issues, some of which divided churches over. Uh, one of the key ones, and this isn't just in the South, we, we've experienced what you wear to church. Because you're going to church, you're going to meet with God, you need to put on your best. If you were gonna meet with the President of the United States, you'd wear your best. And how could you not go to church and wear a suit and a tie and wear, wear your best? or wear a hat in church. Oh, how could you wear a cap? Because you remove your hat in the presence of, it's a sign of respect and authority. Meanwhile, you've got people that are going, I wore my best hat today for God. That's why I did that. I, I read of a church once where the baseball hat issue blew up in the church. And the pastor finally said, hey, we're gonna give freedom to wear hats. And 15% of the church left. You go, Whoa. Dancing. Man, when I was growing up, dancing, dancing in church. You don't dance in church because you, you just don't dance. Because dancing only leads to one thing. <laughs> and you don't do that. Playing cards. My mom was very fundamentalist. You weren't allowed to have a... You, you could play any other kind of deck of cards, but not a real deck of cards. And anytime you kind of drill in, give, give me the reason behind it, it's just wrong. That was always the, it's just wrong. Women in pants or shorts 
or men and women swimming together in the same swimming pool. They called it mixed bathing. That was the term for it. Some of you that grew up in this, some of you are looking at me like, you are nuts. And some of you are shaking your head. You're going, yeah, I remember that. It was the issues of the time. Back in 1928, Donald Barnhouse, he's a famous teacher in Philadelphia. He's teaching at a camp, Christian camp, and two older women came up to him. They're really upset because younger women at the camp were running around without hosiery on. They had bare legs. It's just wrong. And, and Barnhouse looked at him, he said, uh, you know, from what I can tell in reading scripture, the Mary, the mother of Jesus, never wore hosiery in her life. Amen. He said, it's interesting because in history, if you look back, the first evidence of anybody wearing hosiery was in the 15th century in Italy when prostitutes started wearing them. They kind of started shrinking a little bit. He said it wasn't until, you know, 18th, 19th century that in Victorian England that women wore them and then they became a sign of virtue with that. Again, part of what he's kind of showing is some of these things, they change. And when we draw these lines with that, translation of the Bible, this has divided a lot of churches. I mean, are you gonna preach and teach out of God's English, the KJV, or have you watered it down? Trick-or-treating on Halloween. Oh yeah, I felt a little bit there. People are like, no, no. What do we, what do we allow? I, I, I had one group, they got, the church got sideways over Lent. Do we recognize Lent? And do you give up something for Lent? And people that had come from very liturgical churches were like, of course you do. That's what you do in the springtime leading up to Easter. And people that were kind of anti-liturgical were like, you're trying to bring things into the church. And there was division over it. How about how you school your children? Are you supposed to homeschool them? Or Christian school them? Or no, you're supposed to put them in a public school. Well, you can see some divisions quick over it. Do you let your kids play those violent video games? Do you wear a mask or no mask? <laughs> oh, now we're getting there, huh? I've heard, especially politically in the last few years, I've heard the statement, as a Christian, I've heard people say, as a Christian, I could never vote for candidate X, Y, Z. And then I've heard right behind it, as a Christian, I can't fathom anyone not voting for candidate X, Y, Z. And the division that comes over. The, probably the biggest one when I was growing up, especially in the South, was Alcohol. And you can see, I mean, in our country, we've had a history. We had a whole temperance movement. It was, it was in the constitution. It was outlawed and it was driven by Christians. Uh, the, the temperance movement around that. And, and you can see why one in seven people that drink have serious problems with it. We've seen the devastation around it. The flip side of it though, is there's not a scriptural prohibition. If anything, I mean, Jesus drank alcohol. And it was actually wine, guys. It, it wasn't grape juice. I'll just go on the record. He drank wine and, and they, they spoke to it. But man, when I was growing up, especially if you were a good Christian, good Christians didn't drink. Maybe some of the liberal mainline denominations, but good Christians didn't. I mean, all, all of these things, it's, it's interesting. These are all the issues that Paul says here. And isn't it interesting? A lot of times when churches struggle, it's over this line, not as much these. We, we can be in absolute agreement on these things and then divide over this. In that, there's one other thing you look at it. I love how Paul does this. In matters of opinion, there'll be different perspectives. Look, he puts two categories here. He says, you have the strong. These are those that have the freedom to participate or engage and the weak, their conscience does not permit them to participate or engage. He says, you can always have two categories of people around this. Strong and weak. And I love how he does it because it's very counterintuitive. We would be tempted, especially if you're legalistic, you kind of go, whoever doesn't do that, they're the strong Christians. Paul says, no, actually, we're going to flip it around. Uh, give it out of my own life. I don't drink. I personally don't. Um, and the reason I don't is not biblically. If anything, I see a biblical case in parts of it. I don't because there's a lot of alcoholism in my family. 
I did when I was young and I never handled it well. It was always bad. It just was not a good thing in my life. And so at some point I just realized it's simpler for me to not. And especially, you know, I buried a brother when he was 42 years old and he died from alcoholism. And it pretty profoundly impacted me. And, and so for that, not morally, just simply, I just go, I don't. Now, my wife does enjoy a glass of wine. So we have alcohol in our home. I asked her permission, by the way, to share this. You know, some of you are like, <laughs> boy, when you get home, yeah, no. <laughs> and here's the reason why. She never had a drop till she was well into adulthood. She's never struggled with it, ever, ever. I've never seen her ever in 30 plus years of marriage that you'd even go, there's a hint of, it's just have a glass of wine and she'd enjoy that with a meal. So we have alcohol in our home and it's not something that I struggle with. I like, I'll have a champagne toast at a wedding or that. I'm, I'm not like this fringe worried about it. But if Lee and I, if we were to sit down with the apostle Paul and we said, hey, this is what I do and this is what she does. Paul would look at us and he'd go, okay, in this case, Lee, you're the strong one. Tim, you're the weak one. Now he's not saying that I'm weak in my faith, I'm so far behind her and everything. He's just saying in this context with this issue, this is how it would be defined because your conscience doesn't give you the freedom to participate in that and you've embraced that and chosen that. She does. There's a genius in the way he did it because there's part of it. We're so quick, especially if you're on the legalistic side on things, you think that is an area of strength. And Paul looks and he says, well, on these issues, actually you, you need to, every one of you, listen to your own conscience, but don't define yourself off of it. And so as you looked in the passage, he says, each person should live according to their conscience before God. He says, you're gonna answer to God. And so you need to think about your conscience before God. On any of these issues that go along, don't just assume you do have the freedom. I mean, if you find yourself, and maybe it's alcohol, maybe you find yourself in a context that you go, man, I know other believers that do that. They're not your excuse for doing it. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit. And there may be something unique to your background. There may be something unique to your story. There might be a unique season that you're in with that, that the Holy Spirit looks at you and says, yeah, that's not gonna be a part of your life. And you listen to that. Because if something is sin to you, then it is sin. Even if it's not a first or second level issue, if your conscience is telling you, man, I shouldn't do this before God, you listen to God. He says, everyone needs to, to be sensitive to your conscience. Now I say that, you also know that you need to be open to growing where needed. Your conscience may have been shaped off of a mistruth. And, and so you see this in scripture. Peter's conscience really struggled having a meal with Gentiles. Even though he had gone to Cornelius' household, even though God had called him to that, later Peter started struggling. He got back with other Jewish believers and they were like, man, I can't believe you're having meals with Gentiles. Do you realize what that means and what they, you know, and what they eat and all with that? And so Peter started struggling in his conscience and he stopped having meals with them. And we see in Galatians 2, Paul confronted him over it. Peter, you're wrong here. That even though you're calling it your conscience, it's actually based on wrong truth. And so you need to grow in that. I, I remember when, when I was growing up, a Christian school and, and other parts, there was, there was a movement that hit for a while that all rock music was sinful. And then I remember that they would show us in chapel, they would show us these documentaries and they had this one guy, he was like, I've studied tribal music and what the drums do and they're all demonic. So anytime you have drums in music and this, it's based on this. The real, that's wrong. It's very ethnocentric to begin with, maybe a little racist in places, but it was just wrong. Now you don't, that doesn't mean you have to like rock music. But you can't sit there and go, well, I'm gonna go and write it off as that's all wrong in that based on wrong teaching because it's not in scripture. Uh, you, you can see it in these different ways that you have to grow. Some people, especially growing up in the South, some people would make a biblical case why it was wrong to marry interracially. That's just wrong. 
And people have been shaped by that and then they're conscious and then and anytime they're around it, it, it triggers with that. And I would just say, that's a category. No, you need to grow because the Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that you can't marry interracially. And so if you find yourself, man, you know someone and you see that and you're triggered by that, that would be an area that I go, there is place to grow in our conscience. Our conscience are not perfect is what I'm saying. And so in this process, you always wanna go back to, okay, God, what is the reason I'm saying this? Is it based on your word? What are you saying in my life? Is it based on how I see people? See, all of this, and here's what I love, because we would love it if Paul would just say, instead of teaching us all this, if he would just give us two chapters of rules. You can do this, you can't do that. You can do this, you can. We would actually love that. We go, okay, good, it's so simple now. But you know what would happen? We would worship the rules. And God said, you know, I've got something much more exciting. I actually want to have a dynamic relationship with each one of you. And you have a unique curriculum. And your curriculum's not like theirs exactly. Because there's things in your life, I may say to you, you don't need to do that. And you need to trust me with that. And they need to trust me with that. And then the way you treat each other needs to be reflective of that. See, look, look how he puts it. He, he's told us, he said, we must accept one another without judging, demeaning, or avoiding. He says, first of all, you can't judge. And this he's writing to the people that would fall under the weak categories. So the, the Jewish believers that are going, they eat that meat, they were judging the Gentiles that did. If I were to go, I don't drink... You drink, you have alcohol. See, he goes, hey, just because you don't have the freedom to do that, you're not their judge. You don't know what the Holy Spirit said to them. You don't know what God's saying. They're gonna stand for him one day, not you. So stop judging people over these issues. Now again, let's be clear. We're talking about these issues, this, this level with these matters of opinion. Here's the other side of it. And he's writing to the strong. He says, don't be demeaning to them. So here's the flip side of it. Some of you, you love nothing more than getting together and you have a dinner cart party and you have a nice glass of wine. And you look over to, you know, the poor sap like me that, you know, oh, well, I don't drink. And you go, oh, bless his heart. <laughs> oh, he, he, you know, he's not as refined as we are. Can't enjoy life in Jesus like we do. You, you don't know. You don't know my story. You don't know what's going on. And, and so Paul looks at both sides of it and he says, hey, just cut out the attitude. Cut out judging. Cut, cut out demeaning. Just because their curriculum that they're doing with the Holy Spirit doesn't match yours exactly on these matters of opinion. And to both, he says, and cut out avoiding each other. Because here's what we usually do. We probably don't say things about it, but we start segmenting our lives that the only people we hang out with are people that practice just like we do. And so, you know, I'm not gonna invite them to the dinner because we all like to enjoy this and I don't know if they do. So it's just easier to avoid. Or I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be seen with people like that. Guys, do you realize Jesus spent his whole life, his reputation was based on the fact he hung out with people who did things that he didn't do? But he made it a purpose. He says, we're going to connect and do life together. And Paul says, in a church, you have to, to live this out. There's a great freedom that comes when you stop trying to judge there's a great freedom that comes when you realize, you know, one day they're gonna stand before Jesus. And I love how Paul puts it. He says, we all stand before Christ and give an account for our lives one day. You don't have to worry about judging them because one day they'll stand before Jesus and he knows them better than you do. He knows the whole story. He knows everything about them. And so instead of you getting all upset or dividing or making issues, releasing some of these things and go, you know, Jesus, you're in control of their life more than I am. 
And I need to think about what I do. He says, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you celebrate or whatever you do, are you doing it in a way to bring him the greatest glory? That's what you need to focus on. And I've learned over years of pastoring on issues, usually when I jump to quick conclusions on things, man, it just helps to stop and go, Jesus, I'm gonna trust you with this. Uh, Chuck Swindoll tells a story in the, the book, Grace Awakening. He was speaking at a Christian conference one week and he met this couple at the beginning of the week, nice couple. And, uh, but every time he would start his session, he, you know, he'd see him sitting out there and he said, like within 10 minutes, the husband would be sound asleep every talk. <laughs> and so he kind of just clicked in his mind, oh, she must have drug him to this conference. He doesn't really want to be here. You know, he obviously doesn't take it very seriously. At the end of the week, after the last session, the wife came down and she said, it has been such a blessing to be here. She said, can I talk to you for a minute? And he thought it was going to be, could you help me with my husband who doesn't seem very interested? She said, I I just want you to know what this meant to my husband. He has terminal cancer. This was his last wish. You're his favorite teacher. He wanted to hear you. And he's on such heavy medication, it makes him so drowsy. But I can't tell you what it's meant to him that we were here this week. Swindoll said he sat there and said, I've never been so convicted in my life. Man, how far I'd missed it. I would just say this in pastoring over years. Um, When you're in a church like this and we have a lot of different people and a lot of different stations and things, we're gonna disagree. You're gonna see things. And our brains are real quick to assume, oh, I know what's going on there. I know that. Don't do that. It's an act of faith that you go, God's got them. God, they're, they're going to answer to you one day. Now, if it's a sin in their life, if it's one or two, yeah, as a brother or sister of Christ, of course we step in and say, hey, I'm seeing something here. This doesn't match the Bible. This doesn't match what, that's an act of love. But if it doesn't match my opinion, man, out of love, you, you step back and you go, I'm not going to pull back from them. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to demean them. Because we're family. We're the family of God. Now, there was one other issue, though. You say, well, Tim, but what about people around if my activity causes them to stumble? And look, as Paul finishes the chapter, read with me. We'll, We'll deal with this last issue that he's dealing with here. So he says in verse 13, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but it's unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let it be said, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God, approved by men. Let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it's wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It's good not to eat any meat or drink or wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith, but whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So Paul says, okay, you're in this situation. You're not judging each other, but... Some of the believers, they would come together. Let's say they were coming together for a meal and you bring out the meat. And they're struggling in that moment because they go, oh man, this this whole meal, everything we're doing here is causing me to stumble. Paul says, in that case, he goes, I'm looking at you that are strong. Yeah, of course you have the freedom to do this. Of course you have the freedom to engage in it. 
But we would sacrifice our freedom for those we're causing to stumble. Because it's all about love. Chapter 15, he says, that's what Christ did for us. He sacrificed everything out of love. So of course we would do that. If the situation came up, let, let's say one day I started really struggling. I felt like, man, I, I, I'm gonna start drinking and it's not gonna be good. Man, if I went to Lee and I said, hey, I am, I am really struggling here just to even have an alcohol in the house and just watching you have a glass of wine, that, that's hard for me. I can promise you, you know what she would do within five seconds? It's all gone. Because she loves me. She's for me more than anything else. That's why I, I had no doubt about that. And, and Paul's looking at us, he says, hey, you guys are family too. So you don't want to make anyone stumble. Now, let me be clear on what stumbling is. Because sometimes we, we equate that if anyone knows that you do that. So if anyone knew that you drank, they would stumble. Judging is not stumbling. It's just judging. Stumbling would mean I'm putting them in an environment where it's really hard for them. And so like if I had somebody over and man, they've come out of alcoholism or they struggle with it or maybe you're having a life group or you're together with it and man, you, you always put wine out. And if they came to you in privacy and said, hey, I'm really struggling. I know everybody enjoys, but I'm struggling with that. Do you have to do that? You would say, of course, we're not gonna do it in this setting. Of course, I would never do this in a way you matter more than this. Now, what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we now have to hide all the things we do. And when I was growing up, a lot of people taught it this way. You can drink, but no one can ever know that you did. That's not what Paul's teaching, guys. That ends up in some levels of hypocrisy. Because Paul freely said in this passage, I eat meat, guys, I eat meat. He's not hiding that from anyone. But he would in a moment's notice, oh, that's an issue for you? Hey, it's veggies tonight. Because you matter more than my freedom. And I want to make life about building each other up more than that. I, I read an illustration. There was a couple in their 30s and they drank wine. They enjoyed that until they, they found themselves, they moved into a housing complex in a low-income housing complex, part of their ministry there, they said our first shock when we moved in was the amount of substance abuse that surrounded us. I would go get my mail and find a man blocking the stairs, passed out and unresponsive till 11. We have neighbors who eat raw chicken when they're drunk and they get sick. Others from alcohol-related psychosis. They bang symphonies on the trees outside our window at all hours of the night. There's empty vodka growlers that line the living room of one. There are people who die because of alcohol, cirrhosis, asphyxiation from vomit. Suddenly for us, alcohol is not very fun. Instead, it's a substance that changes my friends and my neighbors that makes them unpredictable, unsafe. There are other neighbors here too, people in stages of recovery. They shake their head and they tell me they don't touch it anymore because every day they're sober is a gift. After a year of living among them, we as a couple, just we just stopped during this season of our life. We, we, we just didn't want that to be a part because we love the people that God had called us to. Notice her attitude in there. It's, it's not like this, oh, it's right, wrong, or that. She just said, hey, for us in this season, missionally with what we're doing, we love these guys so much. There's nothing we're holding on to our life. There's no freedom that we say is more important than another person. And Paul said that should be the attitude of everybody in the church. So, so when it comes to these issues, and again, we're talking about these matters of opinions. He, he, he says, be confirmed in your conscience. You need to know before God, hey God, what do I have the freedom to do? Secondly, be consistent. But third, be considerate. Always consider those who are around and reach them in love. See, the, the reason this isn't so important, and I'll come back to it, the reason he's writing we need to be willing to sacrifice for anybody who's struggling because the unity of the church is a vital part of our witness to the world. 
It comes back to, we're trying to reach a world who doesn't know Jesus. We're trying to show them God's done this miraculous thing in our life. We're trying to show them, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, if you're a Jew or a Gentile, it doesn't matter what your background has been, it doesn't matter what your race is, it doesn't matter on any of those things. Jesus saved all of us and he united us and he's changing us and you need to experience this too. And one of the main ways we show this miracle of salvation is the miracle of unity. Amen. That's why it's important. Jesus said in his prayer over us, he said, I do not ask for these only, but those who will believe in me through your word, that they may be one just as you are. He prayed this directly for you and me, that we would be one, just as Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father are one. He says, Father, you, Father, are in me and I in you. They may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You hear what he's saying there? You hear what he's praying? He says, one of the reasons the world would ever believe in Jesus is they look at the church and they go, man, those people are unified across every line. That's why it's so important we can't let these issues divide us. That's why we have to live considerate and loving. Have you ever been out with a family? You ever been out with another couple where they're fighting the whole time? Just bickering the whole time? And at some point you're just like, how quickly can this dinner end? I wanna get out of here. You ever been at a house where the family members scream at each other all the time? It's just so uncomfortable. And I wonder at times when the world right now looks at the family of God, do they see people that they go, oh man, look at how they love each other. Look at their unity. Or do they get a little uncomfortable and go, man, I, I just don't like to be around the bickering of Christians with Christians. See, guys, it's bigger than us. It's more important than us. It's hard work. It's humbling work. But we do this because of the grace extended to us through Christ. In fact, as we finish out today, I, I can't think of a better way to finish this out than to remember what unites us. Remember what brought us together. It is that good news. It is that gospel. It is because Christ died for us. So I'm gonna ask if, if you're a follower of Jesus, we invite you to take communion with us. And as you do that, before you do though, would you just take a minute? Because I think the apostle Paul always tells us before you come to this and remember what Jesus did, it's a great place to just examine your own life. And so will you take a minute right now, just bow your heads where you are. And maybe today there was something that God has been convicting you in your conscience that you need to stop. And maybe it's right for someone else, but it's wrong for you. And just tell him, I'm gonna give that up to you because I wanna follow the conscience you've given me. And maybe you're here today and there's somebody that you've been uh, judging. And right now you need to confess that to the Lord and say, Lord, I I'm gonna release them to you. I'm tired of being divided over this. Maybe you're here today and you feel convicted because we've not been living like family the way we should as the church. Maybe this is a great moment to just go, Jesus, draw us together around the things that matter most. Lord, we come to you. We do thank you. We thank you for what Christ did on the cross. We thank you for the freedom we have in him. We thank you that we can be a church family. We can be the people of God. Lord, I thank you for a miracle that you started 2,000 years ago when you took people from all different nations, all different walks of life, you took male and female, you took people 
of all different races and socioeconomic classes. And through this miraculous power of conversion, you changed our relationship with you and you changed our relationship with each other. Lord, it is such a miracle. I pray we would live this miracle before a watching world. I pray that even as you pray, Jesus, that we would be one and people would believe in you because of what they see in us. And we recognize we struggle with this. We've struggled as a church over the last several years across this country and around the world. And so Lord, my prayer now is even as we come to take this communion, we would remember what Christ alone did for us and we would be united by the good news of who he is and what he's done. And we pray this in his name. Let's remember him by taking the bread. We are united because Christ's body was broken for us. Let's take and eat. Let's take the cup. We are united because Christ's blood was shed for us. Let's take and drink. Hey, let's stand together and let's finish out an affirmation of who he is.